that SHOUT acronym I mentioned stands for Support Hospital Opioid Use Disorder Treatment. Um, please note, as I just mentioned to those who have come in, um, we are recording these sessions for later distribution through the Texas Mood YouTube page. Know that your names don't appear on the session, nor does anything else you list in the chat. Blair, I see you have a, a hand raised. I just want to address that. Oh, we'll lower that hand then. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, a few quick announcements before we get started. My name is Andrea Roche. I'll be facilitating our session today. There is a, a kind of large group joining, so we're not going to do introductions of all participants, but please to help us with our record of attendance, we ask that you enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat function. This just helps with our record keeping. Um, to access that chat feature, just go to the bottom of your Zoom window and click on that speech bubble icon on the navigation bar. And if you've joined by phone only, you won't be able to do that, obviously. But know that we may call you after the session just to confirm your, your attendance. This is just for record keeping, and we appreciate your help with it. Um, we do love to see everybody's smiling faces. So if you are comfortable and able, we encourage you to join by video, especially for the discussion portion in the latter half of this session. We encourage all of you to speak, but do ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. Um, to mute and unmute, just press the microphone icon on the bottom left corner of your Zoom navigation bar. Or if you've joined us by phone only, you can press star six and just know that there's a bit of a lag. Um, again, through the chat or through, through audio, we ask that no protective health information be shared during either the didactic or the, the case discussion itself. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are recording these sessions and we will make them available on the Texas Mood YouTube site. Um, we'll share information for that in just a few moments. And uh, our didactic today is going to be about applying a systems-based approach to opioid use disorder in the hospital. Following that, we're going to have a case, to, case presented excuse me, by John Peter Smith Hospital. Um, we're going to start with some introductions of our hub team now, followed by didactics, and then some announcements from the Texas Mood team and the case presentation and open discussion. So let's get to our hub for introductions. Rich, can you start? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Rich Botner. I'm a physician assistant in the Division of Hospital Medicine at Dell Medical School, and I'm the director of our Support Hospital Opioid Use Disorder Treatment Program here. Thank you. Blair. <clears throat> Oh, Blair, we can't hear you. Sorry. I'm also logged in separately. I'm going to have to switch over halfway through, so apologies. Um, sorry, I'm Blair Walker. Welcome. I am a psychiatrist. I'm chief of psychiatry at Del Seton Medical Center, and I'm the like clinical lead for our B team, our buprenorphine team here in the medical hospital. Thanks so much for joining and appreciate you joining with multiple devices, Chris. <laughs> Hey everybody, Chris Morides. I am a hospitalist. Uh, actually, I'm service dean for lots of complicated patients today at Dallas Eaton. Um, and I'm assistant dean for healthcare value at the medical school and associate chair for quality and safety in our department of internal medicine. Um, and help uh, lead the B team with uh, Rich and Blair and Alana and team. Thank you so much for joining. And um, Kenneth. I thought I saw Kenneth on here. Let me do a quick search. I think maybe we'll we'll skip Kenneth and Jan. I think we also have Miss Jan. How about you, Esther? Hello, everyone. I'm Esther Gomez Wilkinson, Community Outreach Coordinator for Texas Mood, and supporting our uh, Shout Echo today as well. All right. Thank you so much. I'll introduce those other hub team members as they're able to join. Well, with that, we're going to move over to the didactics. Um, Richard, you should have screen share capability when you are ready. Take it away. There we go. Okay. Uh, give me one second to get the screen share going here. Okay. Everybody see the screen, the slides? All righty. Uh, yes, well, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for uh, our, our ECHO program. This is going to be sort of the quick introduction into how do you apply a systems approach to treating OUD in the hospital? Essentially, when you're having a conversation with administrators or fellow clinicians, how do you kind of frame this as being an, an important topic? Um, this is sort of a condensed version of a webinar that we gave um, for Texas Mood and Shout Texas uh, a couple of months ago. And so um, we'll, we'll provide you with some resources on, on how to get sort of the full content. Um, so today, um, I have nothing to disclose, and we're really going to cover three main points here. So we'll talk a little bit about statistics, 
um, related to the opioid epidemic and how those relate specifically to hospital settings. We'll talk a little bit about some epidemiological trends, again, relating that specifically to hospital settings. And then I think kind of the main takeaway here is all of these tidbits that I'll be sharing, all of them can be turned into speaking points as to why this is such an important issue for us to be considering as institutional leaders and advocates and clinicians and administrators within the walls of, of uh, Texas hospitals. So let's kind of get right into it. We're going to start by talking about epidemiological trends. We'll talk about overdose deaths, um, what those sort of look like nationally and in Texas. And then we'll talk about um, opioid prescribing rates and, and how that kind of fits into to all this conversation. Um, this is a bit of an old slide in the sense that it only covers overdose deaths to 2017, and I'll be sharing some additional data in a moment that covers us for a few years in, uh, after 2017. CDC data tends to lag by a couple of years. But what I really want to draw out here is that, you know, prior to COVID-19, we often talked about the opioid epidemic as, you know, the crisis of our time, the public health crisis of our time. And we often framed it as, you know, the number of deaths far surpassing that of the peak of gun violence deaths in the United States, the peak of HIV deaths. And you can see, you know, almost doubling when we talk about overdose deaths related to, to drugs. And the vast majority of these drug overdoses um, are related to uh, opioids. And then, of course, COVID-19, you know, a year and a half ago or so now uh, came to Texas, came to the United States. And, and really, we had these two public health crises that sort of collided. And what we know is that COVID-19 has, has made the overdose crisis uh, um, just so much worse. It has exacerbated the crisis. This is in and of itself a reason to really focus on this across the healthcare system, including in hospitals. So you can see here um, certain parts of the country, uh, overdose uh, deaths increasing by as much as 60% in certain hospitals, as much as 100%, um, you know, in Texas and in this data, which is about six months old or so, um, is, uh, you know, 20%. And it actually encouraged the CDC to release a health advisory as part of the Health Alert Network. Now, they rarely issue advisories in the Health Alert Network. This is not a common thing. They really reserve this for, you know, um, public health issues that are, that are uh, urgent. And um, basically, I'm just going to read a quick part of this. So um, in this data that came out uh, in sort of the third quarter of 2020, um, 81,230 drug overdose deaths had been recorded, representing a worsening of the drug overdose epidemic. So we had been making some progress on this prior to COVID. And I want to be very clear that when I say progress, you know, the, the, the trend was from something like, you know, 70,000 overdose deaths down to, you know, high 70s to low 70s. So still an incredible number of lives lost, people's, you know, parents, children, close friends, et cetera. So I want to just acknowledge that, you know, we were making progress, but still an enormous loss of life. But all of that progress we really lost as a result of COVID. We, we asked people to isolate, to distance. Um, and there, there are a few things worse for somebody with severe substance use disorder that we can ask of them than to remove themselves, um, to, to be isolated, to be by themselves. Um, and to really decrease the access, um, uh, their access to care. And so this was the, the worst overdose um, increase ever recorded, the highest number ever recorded. And you may have actually seen, it's not in the slide deck because it just came out yesterday, the CDC released sort of their early data for 2020. And we had over 90,000 drug overdose deaths in this country uh, the highest number again ever recorded. And so this really continues to be I would argue, you know, the public health crisis of our time, because even as COVID slowly starts to, you know, dissipate and, and hopefully go away for good, um, you know, this drug epidemic is going to continue and, and there is a role for hospitals to play in this. Um, this is kind of what I mentioned earlier, 100% increase at um, one specific urban emergency department, um, again, during, during COVID-19. And as far as Texas is concerned, there's lots of data that I could share about that. In the interest of time, I'll just share this one map that shows that in many ways, the Southwest um, of the country, the, the data that had been reported to the CDC prior to COVID-19 um, showed that maybe we weren't actually having that large of an opioid crisis in Texas. That data has many challenges. And so I would argue that the data previously didn't really paint the right picture, but even with 
those challenges in the way that we collect data in Texas, you can now see that we had a greater than 50% uh, increase in overdoses um, related to opioids, primarily um, fentanyl, right? And, and we know that fentanyl, we think about it as being an opioid problem, but really you're, we're, we're finding fentanyl now in methamphetamine, we're finding it in cocaine, we're finding it in, um, in uh, oxycodone pills that are being sold as oxycodone, but they're actually pure fentanyl. So the fentanyl problem is much larger than sort of just heroin laced with fentanyl, which is how we often think about it. And that is certainly coming, uh, you know, coming to bear in the data for, for uh, Texas. And so the question, the sort of interesting thing about all of this that, that often gets discussed is, you know, when we bring this up to hospitals, they say, well, you know, we're doing things for opioids. We, we've done, we have an opioid stewardship work group. We have a group of clinicians passionate about opioids. And pretty much every hospital in the country now has done something around opioids. The problem is that the something that they've done is primarily around responsible prescribing or appropriate prescribing. How do we make sure that, for example, when patients have a knee surgery or a hip surgery, that they don't leave the hospital with 100 pills of oxycodone, right? That's really been the focus of much of the conversation about opioids in hospitals. And we can see that that's having an effect. So as a healthcare community, we are prescribing lower doses of opioids, we're prescribing shorter duration of opioids. So we're making progress there, but you have to ask the question, why do we still have this skyrocketing overdose rates, right? The, the answer to this epidemic goes far uh, deeper and more important than just a conversation about opioid prescribing. And the conversation that we need to have now that we've you know, tackled appropriate prescribing in, in many ways, there's still opportunities there, but what we haven't really done well at all is tackled recovery, treatment, harm reduction, these other pieces of the kind of solution, if you will, that largely go unaddressed today throughout the healthcare system, including in, in hospitals. So why should hospitals care about this? Many, many reasons related to costs, related to readmissions, um, and, and related to this understanding that hospitalization is a reachable moment to help people with substance and, and opioid use disorders more specifically. Now, I think it's really important that we recognize when we have discussions about this um, and as it relates to the hospital setting, we often discuss it and think of it, the narrative that we get in our mind is the patient who maybe is revived in the community by EMS and then is transported to the hospital or someone who you know, had an overdose who was not fully revived in the community and is transported to the hospital or occasionally the person who shows up to the ER and is going through you know, serious withdrawal and says, I'm here specifically for opioid withdrawal. That's the narrative that we think of, but it's not the only one, right? We know that um, the use of intravenous drugs increases uh, the um, uh, uh, prevalence of uh, sexually transmitted infections, hepatitis C, which is you know has been on the rise for the last decade plus, related to intravenous drug use, untreated, undiagnosed hepatitis C leads to um, liver disease, which again results in you know prolonged, expensive hospitalizations. Infective endocarditis also on the rise related to intravenous drug use. Again, complex, um, long potentially life-threatening um, hospitalizations. And then of course, you know, the, the, the incredible rise in skin and soft tissue infections and not just the treatment needed for those, but just through the lens of imaging, right? And there's a lot of conversation about high value healthcare. How do we reduce the amount of imaging or, or uh, inappropriate imaging? And, and you know, there's a, some really good studies that look at uh, patients who have a history of intravenous drug use. They come to the ER with any sort of skin and soft tissue um, you know, findings, they're getting CT scans, they're getting MRIs. Um, and so again, expensive, high, high utilization within the hospital setting. And these infectious complications have become such a, um, you know, a, a pronounced part of the opioid epidemic that there is now calls for infectious disease specialists who often manage these patients when they have infectious complications to actually dual specialize, not just in infectious disease, but in addiction medicine as well. So, so much of infectious disease practice is now sort of um, uh, incorporated or, or sort of tangled up in, if you will, um, consequences of um, uh, intravenous drug use. We know that people with substance use disorders are more likely to be readmitted within 30 days of hospital uh, discharge, even when we adjust for age, sex, depression, the payer, 
whether or not the patient has housing and the Charlson score for comorbidities, patients with substance use disorders are um, almost two times more likely to be readmitted to the hospital. And we all know that readmissions are one of the holy grails of hospital administration and hospital medicine. Um, and you know, more than, than one in 10 patients with OUD are readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of discharge. So this patient population is, um, is at high risk for readmission to the hospital. Um, and so there are interventions that we can do to help reduce that risk of, of readmission. Uh, we know that people with OUD cost the healthcare system, you know, at least eight times more than patients without this diagnosis. Um, there's a lot of numbers on the screen here. I, I need not read them all to you other than, you, you know, there's a lot of zeros here, right? We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in impact as a result of unhealthy opioid use. Um, and this really is not even since the beginning of the epidemic. This is, you know, capturing a, a, a few years. Um, and specifically to hospitals, they estimate about $11 billion is spent a year by hospitals in the United States specifically related to opioid use disorder alone. And that for many hospitals, that's 1% of all expenditures. So think about your hospital right now and all the things that you spend money on from a uh, you know, um, uh, staff perspective, right? Nursing staff, clinical staff, et cetera. Think about your plant and operations, all of the many, many expenses, 1% of all of those directly related to opioid use disorder. So clearly there's a role for hospitals here. Now, I wanna be clear. When you talk to some folks in the hospital, they'll say, well, we are doing things for patients with OUD. When patients come in and they're in withdrawal, we help them. We provide medications like clonidine and, and, and symptom control with anti-motility drugs and anti-emetics. And we largely feel sort of good about that as clinicians and as hospitals. Um, but in reality, we sort of become part of the cycle um, because when we provide this sort of detoxification, this medical um, detoxification, about 80% of patients who, who use um, illicit opioids will go back to using those opioids within 30 days of discharge. That's a really high sort of failure rate, if you will, in terms of the intervention, right? I think we think that by providing that detox that we're helping those patients on some sort of journey to recovery, but we haven't actually provided them any sort of resources to help them achieve that journey to, to recovery. And so providing detox alone, while often seen as this you know, really helpful, impactful thing, um, truly is, is not. Um, and then of course, we have conversations about patients who self-discharge, up to 30% of patients self-discharge and they who have substance use disorders, and they do so because of inadequate treatment of withdrawal, fear of being mistreated by staff, having opioid cravings that um, are not appropriately uh, addressed during the hospitalization. And again, we view this as a reachable moment. Patients are sort of out of um, triggering environments, surrounded by a hopefully supportive staff. Uh, what an amazing time to help those patients on their journey to recovery or harm reduction, you know, whatever that patient defines as, as what they need in that moment. Um, and I want to be just very uh, clear that we do not advocate for hospitals to become treatment centers, right? Um, certainly, we don't think that hospitals become places where patients go for their longitudinal addiction care. But hospitals are designed and for you know centuries have existed to help people in acute crisis. And addiction, depending on sort of where you are in that cycle of addiction, can absolutely be an acute crisis for the patient. And so hospitals should be equipped with the tools they need to help usher patients towards appropriate resources. And that is certainly what we advocate for. And when we do that, 72% of patients in this one study up in, in the Boston area um, made it to outpatient treatment after discharge. And, and that's compared to 12% of patients who were providing no resources. Patients who basically were provided that detox we talked about on the last slide and sort of sent on their way. Um, we, we, we wish them luck. You know, 12% of those patients are able to engage in treatment. So it's a big difference when we actually have an infrastructure in the hospital that can support um, patients with OUD. And uh, just a few months ago, uh, we were able to publish um, in the Journal of Hospital Medicine, the, the, the uh, two-year uh, findings from our work at uh, Del Seton Medical Center and Dell Medical School in Austin. And in our program, 60% of patients made that first um, outpatient appointment um, and continued ongoing engagement. I'm happy to share this paper with everybody um, later. But the point here is 
we went from zero, right? We had no infrastructure in place to appropriately address opioid use disorder during hospitalization. We built this incredible interprofessional team, many of whom are on the call today. Um, and so we were able to go from zero to 59% um, follow up. Of course, still opportunity for improvement, but light years ahead of where we, uh, where we started. And I want to just you know tease out a couple more things here, and then I'll wrap up my part. Um, you know, we know that when we initiate uh, buprenorphine um, and patients are engaged in, in a buprenorphine plan of care during hospitalization, there's a 53% reduction in 30-day hospital readmissions related to opioid use disorder. And as far as I know, there is nothing really that we do in hospital medicine or in hospitals that I've seen where we reduce readmissions by by more than half. And as you'll see throughout you know, the conversation today and in our future echoes and all the resources that we have as part of Shout Texas and Texas Mood, um, you know, buprenorphine is safe, it's effective, um, it is uh, low cost, um, and it's really just about education and awareness and that's what we're here to, uh, to provide. And then finally, I do quickly want to just share this with you. This is from Vermont, and I totally appreciate the landscape in Vermont is quite different than the landscape here. Um, but I just want to tease out a couple things here, and you'll, you'll get these slides later, so we don't need to go over these line by line. But what you're seeing on the sort of first uh, column of numbers is a group that's engaged in pharmacotherapy for OUD, and then it's comparing um, at a population level with people who are not engaged in medications for opioid use disorder. And what you really see as you go down here is a bunch of statistically significant findings, including decreased utilization of healthcare services, decreased inpatient days in the hospital, decreased visits to the emergency department. Um, and so we know even at a population level, when we, when we bring hospitals into the fold, when we build better systems of care, which again is, includes hospitals. Hospitals are not the single sole solution to the opiate epidemic by no means, but they are absolutely part of that solution. And when we include hospitals and we empower hospitals, patients get better care, um, our staff and our clinicians that work in, in hospitals feel fulfilled and empowered, um, and the healthcare system benefits in terms of um, you know, reduced costs and, and improved uh, efficiency. So I'll kind of wrap this all up by saying you know, that we know that OUD uh, treatment, harm reduction, recovery resources, they reduce mortality, they reduce um, institutional expenditures, they can reduce readmissions, um, and they can really empower staff. And that's really what we are all about um, here at, in this ECHO series. So um, I know that was uh, New Jersey talk fast. That was, <laughs> try, try to pack a lot of information in there. Um, but uh, thank you all again for being here. And I will, uh, I'll take some questions when, when, we have some, uh, when we have some time. But uh, thanks again. And that, that's it. <laughs> thanks so much, Rich. That was a great presentation. If you could unshare the slides, I'll open it back up. Yeah, any questions about the didactic? All right. Well, thank you. That's a sign of a good didactic. Um, if anything does come up, feel free to unmute or use the chat to raise those questions and um, Rich can address them throughout. Well, let's turn now to Esther to provide some um, announcements about upcoming programming with the Texas Mood. Ready when you are, Esther. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining us today uh, at the Support Hospital Opioid Use Disorder Treatment ECHO. Of course, you'll, again, you've probably heard us say we refer, refer to that as Shout Texas. Texas Mood is the largest training and technical assistance center focusing on in SUD in Texas. And we act as a one-stop shop for those working in addiction treatment and recovery services. Next slide, please. Uh, Texas Mood offers education, training, resources, and research for the SUD health uh, care workforce. Our clinical services are focused on expanding access to compassionate evidence-based treatment and recovery support services for the uninsured. Our telemetering efforts aim to improve the quality of care and expand our skilled treatment workforce across the state. For many of these trainings mean the difference between life and death, active addiction and recovery. Next slide, please. Um, Shout Texas is a program at Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin and UT Health San Antonio's Texas Mood uh, that is working to increase access to substance and opioid use disorder treatment and harm reduction during acute hospitalization. Shouts Texas's mission is to expand their proven model of hospital-based treatment for OUD to all hospitals in the state of Texas. 
To do that, Shout has developed a robust collection of education and coaching opportunities, including a monthly ECHO series, um, monthly general office hours, a bi-monthly OB-focused office hours, and an expansion pilot program, which includes which can include $35,000 in seed funding to start similar programs at hospitals across the state. Next slide, please. We hope you, we hope you can join us at our next Shout uh, Echo set for Thursday, August 19th, where we'll hear from Dr. Lucas Hill on naloxone prescribing and nutrition and distribution, I apologize, in the hospital. Uh, you'll see we do have a QR code on this slide to register for that program. At the end of today's session, we will certainly have this slide up again to give you an opportunity to grab that QR code. Uh, we also have Alana from our SHOUT team that's going to share that registration link in the chat. Next slide, please. Um, we are excited to introduce our new HEROES helpline for all first responders and healthcare workers. This also includes all allied healthcare professionals. It is absolutely free and provides complete confidential telephone-based peer support and refer referral services to all first responders and healthcare workers in Texas. Our heroes have the opportunity to seek treatment without fear of judgment or stigma or occupational dilemmas. Screening and referral interventions assist individuals in overcoming barriers, addressing their mental health needs and navigating them to treatment and recovery. We invite you to visit the heroeshelpline.org website for more detailed information. Next slide, please. You may sign up for all of the Shout Texas education opportunities on our website at shoutx.org. The next round of pilot site seed funding will be opening in the fall. If your organization is interested in the, this funding opportunity, please email the Shout team to get connected at shoutx at austin.utexas.edu. Next slide, please. In an ongoing effort to provide you better services and support, we would like to request your feedback about today's session. We'll be providing a link in the chat uh, to a survey, and also we will be sending that to you via email. You may only you only have to submit that survey once. Uh, this survey is also how you will get your CUs and must be filled out within a week for us to issue those credits. We thank you for your support, and we hope to see you next month. Thanks. Thanks so much, Esther. Lots of comments uh, and content there. Any questions? If you haven't seen the chat lighting up and flashing orange, just uh, keep an eye on that for resources that are already being shared today. And thank you, Alana, for sharing um, registration for next month's ECHO. Well, at this time, we're gonna turn over to the case presentation for today. Dustin, you're presenting our case today. Would you mind introducing yourselves? And um, ECHO IT is gonna share the form you submitted. We'll scroll through that. And then after your presentation, we'll open up the room for some conversation. Fantastic. Thank All right, when you. you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'm Dustin DeMoss. I'm the uh, medical director for the Trinity Springs Inpatient Psychiatric Hospital here in Fort Worth at the JPS. And I'm just the uh, fortunate and unfortunate spokesperson for our team here at JPS. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, some of my colleagues, Dr. Halliburton, uh, Dr. Lefebvre, Dr. Netienne, uh, and uh, PA Maddie Escamilla, who uh, has helped um, get kind of our, our foray into substance abuse treatment started here at JPS. Um, and before we dive into the case, I'd like just to kind of set the, the, the stage here at JPS, if you will. Um, JPS, we had no, no addiction, no substance abuse treatment service line whatsoever until um, our uh, um, emergency medicine colleagues were able to acquire a grant to get to avoid prescribing opiates in the ER and also establish um, what is now our bridge clinic, which is our, our, our current treatment uh, platform for opiate use disorder. And so when patients are identified either in the hospital or in the ER by our ER colleagues or in the hospital um, as having, you know, being at risk for OUD or having OUD or are in active withdrawal, then um, they can administer um, what is now on our formulary, buprenorphine, um, and uh, our, cons our um, psychiatry colleagues are consulted actually automatically to help guide the primary teams through how to, um, how to initiate, when to initiate, and, and those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of questions. So JPS is relatively new um, to uh, providing treatment in, in the medical setting um, for OUD. And so just with that background, um, 
this case, and it, it was a perfect match for today's lecture. And I was going to ask, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, uh, waste too much of my thunder asking Rich some of those questions initially. But I do have some questions that I'll get to uh, for him uh, as we go through the case. Um, so I guess um, the question that I that I have for us um, regarding to the case is uh, some guidance around some of the tele visits uh, because as you'll see that that would have been very beneficial for us um, and then also you know um, there were you know the patient had some procedures so I we'll want to refresh our audience on the uh, current guidance and to uh, when to stop or continue view. Um, um, when a patient is either going through a procedure or you're anticipating a procedure in the not too distant future. And then also, you know, you have a physician who, or, or provider who um, initiates the buprenorphine treatment for a patient and then um, leaves town. And if we're the only buprenorphine provider for that patient, uh, if they return, you know, what kind of cross coverage can we offer? Um, and, and still be within the, the, the confines of, of the regulatory uh, bodies uh, that govern buprenorphine treatment or uh, buprenorphine prescribing rather. Um, so to our case, uh, we have a, a young female, a 49 year old lady who came to our emergency departments um, in acute sepsis. Uh, she was febrile tachycardic and um, she has a known history of IV drug use. Uh, hep C, as well as a previous history of uh, MRSA bacteremia. Um, she was admitted emergently, and um, you know, she was found to have uh, a, a ton of abscesses, uh, some uh, dermal, within the dermal layer, and some, um, there was one that was found to be presacral in nature, uh, orthopedics, uh, surgery, and also our um, uh, interventional radiology colleagues were consulted but on the initial, um, initial, uh, initial scans, they thought that the pre area was a little too limited to, uh, to drain through an IR approach. Well, upon expanded view with an MR series, um, she was found to have not only pre but also um, para-psoas um, muscle on the right side, uh, abscess extending into a discal abscess between L5 and S1 that trajected superiorly all the way up uh, to L3 um, and uh, T11. And so she had just a ton of, ton of abscesses um, throughout her, um, throughout her uh, vertebra. Uh, and this, um, this did allow our colleagues to perform um, some intervention, uh, specifically IR drainage of some of the larger abscesses while she under, underwent um, uh, broad spectrum antibiotic treatment. Uh, the patient was admitted um, and her hospital course was, was complex because um, upon initial admission, she reported IV uh, opiate use, uh, was going through withdrawals, but would not comply with uh, a COWS or a clinical opiate withdrawal scale assessment by our psychiatry colleagues because she was also intoxicated with cocaine and methamphetamine at the time. As her course went on, she became more amenable to assessment and we were able to address some of her, not only opiate use uh, disorder, but also some pain that she was experiencing from some of these abscesses um, with uh, buprenorphine. Uh, she was initiated and in, uh, inducted with uh, two milligrams and ultimately settled on four milligrams a day um, of buprenorphine and her pain was controlled and her cravings seemed to have improved. Um, so her, her entire hospital course, she was here um, let's see, for about almost a month, right at a month, um, just, just shy, maybe um, 20, 25 days or so. And um, she was ultimately discharged to a skilled nursing facility because of the, uh, the nature of her, um, her surgical um, and, and IR procedures. Her needs at this skilled nursing facility, so we were able to stabilize her on some, you know, uh, some mild muscle relaxants, as well as the, the four milligrams a day of buprenorphine here in the hospital. We continued those medicines at the skilled nursing facility. With anticipated discharge from that skilled nursing facility back to our bridge clinic, um, so we could help bridge her to her long-term addiction home, um, which is what the, the clinic was designed for. We didn't anticipate that the patient would be at this skilled nursing facility 
past the 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 you know the the one month mark, which she was, uh, and so the prescription for her buprenorphine ran out, and um, there was there was no communication with the uh, nursing home uh, providers, and so when she ran out, um, I guess I sent her to the ER. So unfortunately, she came back to our emergency department. Um, luckily, uh, the, the physician who had admitted her the first time recognized her and said, Hey, this is, this is a simple fix. Let's re-prescribe you, get you back to the skilled nursing facility, getting, getting you into the care that you need. And then we can try to manage doing something else in the meantime before, so we can avoid another emergency uh, department visit. Um, it was at this time that after she was treated um, in the emergency department, sent back to the skilled nursing facility, is when our team got together and said, hey, what um, can we do tele? Uh, should we do tele? What are some of the you know, cross coverage uh, questions that we need answered uh, so we can avoid this in the future potentially? And, um, and so th those are some of the things that um, we wanted to get from, from this body today. Uh, luckily, um, um, in full disclosure, we went ahead with a televisit with that same emergency department provider while she was at the skilled nursing facility because she had she um, had been there uh, for past the the second prescription that she received from JPS, and so we were able to do a third interaction with her via tele, and um, so we wanted to get uh, some uh, some of your thoughts from this body. I'll, I'll stop there and entertain any questions. Thank you. That was very, very nicely delivered narrative of a very, um, very complicated experience with a patient. I see that some other members of your team have joined. I just want to open up to them. Is there anything else you feel um, needs to be added to that conversation before we open up the discussion? All right. Thank you, James. Well, with that, I'll open it up to the group. Any questions for Dustin about this case? Just to, just to help us understand a little bit more, you said you ended up being able to do a televisit. Can you tell us a little bit about how that went? Um, it was our um, it was our ER provide our um, ER attending uh, Dr. Detien who performed the uh, um, the uh, the interaction with the televisit. I want to say, and Jordan, help me, uh, Jordan McCown, she's our, our our project manager for the uh, our bridge clinic. Um, I want to say they used uh, a doximity platform uh, to perform the um, televisit, at least on our end. I'm not 100% sure what was on the uh, on the nursing home or the uh, skilled nursing facilities in. Uh, Jordan, do you know that answer? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we typically use doximity for any telecommunications and, and visits. And I know that in order for uh, the platform to be used that the person on the receiving end of the call, so the patient, um, does not have to have that application installed. It can come through as a FaceTime or a phone call. So I'm not 100% certain how they received the call um, in the nursing home setting, if they used a tablet or, you know, a computer that they had available. But I do know that JPS typically uses Doximity um, in all outpatient settings to do the, the televisits. And then, yeah, another, uh, Dr. Lefebvre uh, is also, one of the questions that we had was, uh, nobody besides the emergency room doc had established a, a relationship, a face-to-face -face relationship with the patient. And so um, we weren't entirely sure how, from a you know, regulatory standpoint, if anybody else who had not established a face-to-face -face relationship with the patient can prescribe via a televisit. Um, and... In, in the, uh, the, the skilled nursing facility wouldn't bring the patient to an outpatient appointment. And they, they had no X wavered uh, physician or provider at the skilled nursing facility. Um, so great I, question, it's Blair. Rich, if you wanna jump in, go for it. No, go ahead, Blair, please. Um, I, I'd say, you know, <clears throat> in my opinion, in general, we err on the side of do what's right for your patient. But I think you're well within the bounds of the law. You guys are partners. And a televisit is still a visit and televisits are 
kosher at this point, thanks to COVID, which broke down a bunch of barriers. Um, we still have um, the the sort of permissions in place to um, to see people via tele visits, and even our Suboxone clinics every via tele. Um, we don't know when that may end. I'm hoping it'll never end, but that's that's our understanding of it. I can tell you in the hospital here, we cover for each other if somebody's out um, when when um, when we're seeing patients. Um, and and I think best practice is to just go wave at them really quickly if you can in person or via tele. But that tele can include visualization or telephone. And, and I think that's fine. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of my thought. I'm curious to hear what, what other people's take on that is. Out in the community, this is Julie Pittman. Um, I'm at Nexus and I have, um, hi Dustin. And I have um, uh, private practice actively using buprenorphine. Um, we've been doing tele with buprenorphine like crazy. Um, and I know that the AAAP, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry is fighting hard to make the in-person crap go away. It is 100% stigma. Um, there is zero reason that buprenorphine should have to be in person if those out doesn't. Um, my bipolar patients are way less stable than my buprenorphine patients are. Um, the only reason to really argue for it is, is you're in drug screens and they can do that whenever. They can do it whenever. So um, until they put the restrictions back in place, I mean, I think a lot of psychiatrists practice best in person, but uh, not if it's just for stigma. <laughs> yeah, Expand hallelujah. Expanding, expanding access to care is absolutely critical. 93,000 people overdosed last year. Yeah. And, so and thank you so much. There, there are so few people testing for fentanyl right now, um, but we are here at, um, at Nexus. And so Fentanyl arrived about four months ago in DFW and it is in the cocaine, it is in the meth, it's in the weed, it's in everything. So people will tell you they're using something, but they're not, they're using fentanyl. Yeah, we found it here in Austin um, in what looked like Xanax pills too. The yeah, Suboxone Clinic was testing their pills, yeah. They, they're pressed in it like um, oxy or hydrocodone, but it, it, it isn't. In, yeah. it's in, There's in no Fort oxy Worth. in it. Yeah, in Fort Worth, it's, it's, I mean, every patient I've seen on consult the last two weeks, that has been revived by Narcan, it is because they're, they are, for some reason, every single one of them is positive for uh, cannabis. Yeah. Hmm. And, and they're, and they're, they have, and if, when you tell them what well, you got back with Narcan, it must've been an opioid of some kind. And they'll look at you like, I don't do opiates. It's in the weed. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. in the weed. I, I, it's yeah. everywhere, yeah. I mean, it's in everything, but here right now today, it's in the weed. I just think any way you could possibly expand buprenorphine treatment, we need to do that. We need to fight for it. So I would, th I would just say do what's right by your patient. And if the regulatory bodies come after you, send them to me. I'll do that. I, I got your number. <laughs> do. You do, actually. I know. I, know. Um, I, I do want to just call one thing out um, that's, that's loosely related to this discussion, which is there, there is quite a bit of emerging litigation on behalf of the federal government, the attorney general's office, um, mostly in Massachusetts, but I've had some recent conversations with um, the AG's office that oversees um, the, the Austin area, which I think is a, is a different region than, than DFW for, for the federal government. Um, but there's this emerging area of litigation around is, is um, uh, refusing access to buprenorphine or methadone at a skilled nursing facility a violation of the American uh, with Disabilities Act. And all of these cases that have, that have gone forward, all of them have been, have been found in, in favor of the, the government who, who, who has said um, that, that in fact it is a violation of the ADA. And so, there's, you know, this is an emerging area. It's still a bit of a gray area because the, the skilled nursing facility, kind of like in this case, can say, well, we don't have anybody with the X waiver, um, especially in the current environment where getting an X waiver takes 10 minutes and not, you know, 10 hours um, or eight hours, as it were. Um, there really is very little excuse around it. So going back to what Julie said, I mean, it's at this point is, is much more about stigma than anything else, um, especially when you have a patient who's been initiated on buprenorphine during hospitalization. So they are relatively stable. So we're not asking SNFs to initiate treatment. 
we're asking them to continue a home medication at that point, um, which you know I would argue is is borderline malpractice at th at this point, right? Maybe a few years ago you could say, well, the eight hours, this and that, um, but there's becoming less and less of an excuse to not do the right thing. Um, and there's, there's some court cases now to sort of back that up. So this is an emerging area. It's going to change over time. Again, loosely related to the conversation, because I would not say to the SNF, well, you better do this or the Attorney General's office is coming after you. That's probably not going to be a constructive conversation. But, um, but I do think that that's the writing on the wall, um, especially with the Biden administration. I mean, they are a very harm reduction oriented, probably the most harm reduction treatment oriented administration ever. So. Yeah. But the last three administrations have been the same. So Obama's was, and, and Jerome Adams' brother is in recovery from heroin. I mean, he did speaking tour, trying to expand buprenorphine treatment. Um, it's been the writing on the wall for a long time. And I think mentioning that this writing is on the wall might help. Yeah. Um, here. There's one other complicating factor to this case. Um, the, the ER doc who did the face-to-face -face and was doing the, the follow-up with this patient, um, our ER physicians are contracted by the hospital. So they're not technically part of JPS. They're, they're an entirely different entity. And I know a lot of hospitals operate that way. Um, what, what is the thought of, of anybody here about the cross-covering um, you know, regulatory stance of somebody who's, I have no affiliation with his, his company. Um, we, the only thing is we work in the same hospital, um, although we have different employers. Does that make any difference? I'm sure lawyers could argue both ways. This is Blair. I, but I, again, would fall back on do right by the patient. You all work together. You have access to their chart. You see what they've been prescribed. Like you are covering for that doctor whether you work for the same employer or not, just when in doubt, like help the patient. I'll tell you, we just, we, we're, we have this happen every once in a while too, where people fall through the cracks and just had a case last week where the Suboxone Clinic like contacted me back, this poor patient we just started, like somebody stole her backpack and all her Suboxone. Like, did we fill that prescription again? Heck yeah, we did. Like, didn't even stop to think about it. Yes, give her more. And she showed up to her next Suboxone Clinic. She just made it again yesterday. So, um, you know, I, I think when in doubt, you just, you help patients and, you know, what would you rather defend? I think is what I, what I teach my residents, what I, what I teach my colleagues, I would rather defend helping people. And I'm not suggesting that people flout regulations, but a lot of these regulations are flawed and, and sometimes vague and sometimes not entirely clear. Like here we are doing this three years in a row and I, I'm pretty sure what we're doing is correct. But, you know, again, letter of the law, like the law is always arguable, frankly, and, and up to ju judicial interpretation. So I think that we do what's right by our patients and take good care yeah. of them and do the best we can with regulations and just move forward and keep well, on Blair, keep on striving to help. Blair, if you've been around and watched the way the DEA sets the regulations, they have no idea. They'll write the laws and then they don't know <laughs> what that means. So like we were on a call with John Renner um, at Harvard, and we were talking to the DEA about how they determine what your number is. Like, how do you determine what is 30 and what is 100? And the DEA was like, what is that? And right. so, like, said, how many active prescriptions you have, or how many you have that week or that month? And they were like, what do you think it should be? And so, John and I were like, well, how about we say if it, the prescriptions expired? And they were like, that sounds great. <laughs> like, what the? What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good to so that's how, again. that's how the DEA decided because we were like, okay, then we do like this. And they have no idea. And so yeah. when the DEA came to visit me, I told them what they should do. And like, they're like, okay, we'll never be back. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> like, yeah. what's going but, on? You know, <laughs> but again, I think, you know, we are not, we are not the pill mill doctors. No. We are the doctors on the front line who are the experts in caring for patients with opioid use disorder. And I'm glad to hear the DEA is listening to what we recommend yeah. because we well, are the experts. Control. I'm supposed so. to. <laughs> but I, I'm like, <laughs> I, I actively replace stolen meds. I'll do it. Up to, I think I do it twice within the six month period. I make them get a police report and because the pharmacy needs it. Um, and it makes the patients anxious. So not, not that those police reports ever go 
anywhere, but it makes the patient anxious. So they'll call and get the right. for a prescription because the pharmacy won't fill it without it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not putting a patient withdrawal. Yeah, sure. Because they're going to use and they're going to overdose. Right. Yeah, we're talking life or death. And I think mm-hmm. that's where we always need to remember uh, that this really is always life or death um, with, with, these, with these substances. They're really dangerous. And I, I call it the so, decent human being rule, the decent human being rule. Be a decent <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, say so don't sleep um, with patients and be a decent human being, so. Yep. Love it. Does anyone have any other thoughts about this, the, this particular question that, that Dustin and his group have posed? So I think the, the next question was um, just getting a little bit of guidance surrounding like what's evidence-based for um, stopping or continuing like someone's home buprenorphine or what's already been started buprenorphine either after or during surgical procedures. And I would say, I guess, I mean, I'm interested to hear, I don't want to like do all the talking, but I'm interested to hear what other people's understanding of this is. There's sort of old school way and then there's newer school way. Uh, does anyone want to jump in and then I'll jump in? Or I can jump in? <laughs> so so old school way and like the like tricksy, like hyperclinical, but maybe doesn't apply clinically um, is you can like drop the buprenorphine to make like more opioid receptors like available so that the opioids work better that you need to use for pain. Um, but really, and, and you'll see erroneously people stopping Suboxone prior to procedures. Those are never recommendations that we're making at this point. The recommendation we make is that you stay on your buprenorphine. Um, th- just like with any patient, when someone goes under anesthesia, the anesthesiologist who is an expert can titrate the fentanyl dose or whatever that they need to use to get the effective sedation they need. And whether they're on Suboxone or they have a monster metabolizing liver, they may need more or less fentanyl or propofol or whatever it is. And so it really doesn't matter if they're on Suboxone or not. I think it's good practice to just warn the anesthesiologist if you're in the hospital, hey, we just started on Suboxone. They had a procedure three days ago. They might need a whole lot more fentanyl this time if you need to use fentanyl. Um, and, and kind of give them a heads up, but they're experts. They do this all the time. They review all the medicines before it goes perfectly fine. I've never heard a peep from any of the anesthesiologists at this point. Um, so we keep people on their buprenorphine. We actually split the dosing. So if they're on once a day dosing for maintenance, um, for opioid use disorder, we split the dosing into at least three times a day, sometimes even four times a day. I let the patients pick what time they want to take their, their, medicine and if they want to take one that's stronger at night or in the morning or however they really want to run the show on their sort of pain regimen on buprenorphine and we will maximize the dosing if we need to temporarily so your patient in particular paraspinous abscesses ouch like I've seen I'm surprised to hear she was only on two and then four I've had so many patients with those types of abscesses all over that are like climbing the walls um, and needing a lot of opioids on top of suboxone so Say someone came in and they were on, you know, eight or 12 of Suboxone, I would like to split that up three times a day and then decide with the patient, should we try to maximize your Suboxone first before we consider other narcotics? And then depending on, you know, what their pain needs are, they might need other opioids on top. And pretty much you can use any opioid. The the textbook is sort of fentanyl dilated um, or hydromorphone sort of seem to compete a little bit more readily with the buprenorphine. But, um, but I've seen, you know, we use quite a bit of um, oxycodone on top. Um, I've started to use a lot more hydromorphone or dilated oral versus IV, depending on like, for instance, we'll put someone on three time a day suboxone. They'll have PRN suboxone for pain control needs, but just once a day for wound care, they get a big dose of IV dilated. And it kind of keeps them happy. It keeps them functioning. They tell me, most of them tell me like they don't feel high or anything, but it at least blunts the pain for the wound care. And, and I think the main takeaway is every single person and their pain experience and their liver metabolism and their opioid receptors are different. And you really have to tailor it to that person. And again, like decent, what was that? Decent human? What did you, what did you call it? Decent human? Decent test? human being rule. The decent human yes, being. Decent human being rule. That you assume 
kind of give them the benefit of the doubt and you act as the decent human being doctor too. And, and if they look like they're in pain, they're in pain and they need more of whatever it is. Now, max dosing of Suboxone, um, I think a takeaway for me, and as I've been doing this for like three years now and really using a lot of Suboxone, um, it, we kind of call it 24 milligrams. You can go past 32. Um, I will tell you that you need to be cautious, especially with people with liver impairment. And obviously hepatitis C is very common. Um, I have had a, a monotherapy Suboxone, so uh, serotonin syndrome. So I had a guy who was on 24 milligrams, eight milligrams, three times a day, had a ton of pain. The only other medicines he was on was a non-serotonergic antibiotic and gabapentin. And he got rip-roaring delirious all of a sudden. And I thought, huh, maybe it's the gabapentin. I'll back off that. And so I backed that off. And the next day he was myoclonic jerking and twitching and went, oh, he's got serotonin syndrome for the Suboxone. And oh, I haven't appreciated how severe his liver dysfunction was with the hep C. The second I dropped his Suboxone dosing to four, three times a day, it resolved completely within a day. So, you know, you, you want to just be cautious. That was sort of my end of one to like learn about that. And that's, we did like a little poster presentation. I still need to publish it. Um, but that was a really interesting case. And, and I have seen, and we hear anecdotally from our, from our Suboxone clinic, um, earlier on, I was more aggressive with getting people on eight, three times a day scheduled. And then I was hearing back from the Suboxone clinic as they were coming off the acute hospitalization and acute pain, they were looking a little twitchy, um, and jerky and complaining of jerks. And I think that a lot of them had just a touch of serotonergic toxicity. And so they back them down and they do fine. And so what I have switched to is my go-to kind of protocol is I put people on four slash one of Suboxone TID, kind of waking hours, morning, afternoon, bedtime, let them pick what times they want. And then I have an additional four strip up to three times a day. And that's, that's sort of been my go-to protocol for probably the last year. And it seems to go over really well for most people. Um, so I think takeaway from that is, yeah, mm -hmm. like don't stop the bup, keep it going, try to maximize it to cover pain with bup. It's underappreciated how well it can work for pain. The other thing I didn't mention was multimodal pain control. So using things like gabapentin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, the things that will also blunt pain. And don't let people say, what, Tylenol? I don't wanna take Tylenol. It's like, no, no, it works really well. Like let it help. So that's the other, that's the other piece. Um, anyone have Thank any other you, questions wanna, about that? Yeah. I want to open up the room just before we end. Yep. Dustin and your team. All right. Well, um, Blair, that was a really helpful explanation for the, the piece around um, you've been in the context of surgical procedures. I wonder if in our final moments, if you could kind of return to the other two questions that Dustin and his team brought up about guidance on televisits, and um, covering, covering providers. We hit on those during the discussion, but if you could maybe give us a takeaway point. In the meantime, I'll ask yeah. FYT to go on and share QR codes for registration for next month's session. Cool. Thank you, Blair. Um, yeah, my pleasure. I, I would say um, kind of takeaway points on the um, kind of covering providers. In general, do right by your patient. If you have a, a colleague who has prescribed buprenorphine for your for a patient, like you can cover for them and prescribe some more and kind of refill, just document well. Um, and then same with Telly. Telly is kosher. It's Telly is kosher in the state of Texas. We're gonna fight to keep it kosher in the state of Texas. And I think we can also all be squeaky about that with our kind of local legislators. Um, I think those are my main takeaways. If anyone has any other takeaways, maybe jump in. I think that was a great summary. Thanks for returning to those points and for the, the specificity of guidance you gave for that, for that last question. Thank you, Keita, for sharing registration for the next session. And you've also received the, the link for the survey. We appreciate the feedback in the session about future didactics. We take that into consideration. And we also encourage you to, to fill out that post-session survey to give us even more of that feedback. Thanks to the Hub team for showing up today and helping have such a wonderful conversation. Thanks to our presenters, especially you, Dustin. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. We hope to see you at a future Echo. Excellent. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you all.